Hello, and welcome to a different video for me, kind of a different one. I've been doing a lot of weird shit actually lately, so maybe it's not different. Um, I swear more in this one than any of the others. I don't know what came over me. Sorry, mom. Today, I'm going to be watching a portion of an interview between Joe Rogan and Richard Dawkins. They talk about Mormonism. It's kind of silly. Uh, then they talk about heavier stuff, and it's not silly. And we watch it and, and give our thoughts. And by we, I mean I uh, and all the voices in my head. So uh, strap in, like, I, I always forget to say this, but, you know, like the shit if you like it. Um, subscribe, please hit subscribe. Share this with a friend. All right, let's get into the clips. Young religions, to, as I've gotten older, are more interesting. Things like Mormonism and more particularly Scientology, which is even more preposterous, probably the most preposterous one that we have. Though those are really interesting to me. They are interesting, but because they're so young that you can see how they grew up, you can see yes. the actual process. Uh, M Mormonism, I'm depressed by how successful it is. Uh, actually, Scientology as well, but Mormonism, since I mean, we know Joseph Smith was a charlatan. Um, everything about him screams charlatan. Dawkins puts it well. He's depressed by how successful such a young religion is. I want to say two things here. I share the sentiment, but not exactly. The reason that I'm hesitant to agree with this full stop is I'm always cautious that whatever I now am could be considered a religion and that by me pushing people to join me or being depressed when they don't agree with my new religious ideology that I'm becoming a hypocrite and this idea the the way that I see it is life is very complicated it can be very hard sometimes Nobody really knows what happens to us after we die. That can be a really stressful thing to be bouncing around in your brain. And, you know, for some people, they, they say all religion is medicine. And for some people, maybe the type of medicine that they need, the type of medicine that actually makes them the best person they can be is Mormonism. Now, for me, that wasn't the case. I don't think that Mormonism was the type of medicine that I needed in order to be the best person that I can be. But I, I mean, I agree with him. I, you know, sometimes I look for a long time, I looked at my family and I wanted all of them to leave the church with me. And, you know, I thought, I thought it would be cool. You know, my parents would, I thought it'd be cool. I don't know how else to say it. Um, the church was such an important part of my life growing up. And the church was such an important part of the relationship that I have with my family. And then to lose that, I had to suddenly work much harder to have a relationship of any kind with my family. And so for a long time, I thought it would be cool or helpful or just nice if they would just leave just like I did. And interestingly enough one of the things that spurred me into filming this video right now is i was talking to a really close friend of mine who has left the church as well and he had to stop by my parents house today for something and so he was there they don't know that he's left yet but you know pretty soon the conversation turned into oh doesn't the church just make your life so much better doesn't the uh you know doesn't your calling just make you love the church better doesn't everything just make your life better and aren't we so blessed and thank you joseph smith was was the conversation that my parents wanted to have with my friend and it was far enough into the conversation that it seemed like he was agreeing with them that he was suddenly like wait a second do they now think that i'm still active is it wrong that they think that what am i doing here and i'm just gonna throw in some unsolicited advice here if you're watching this video you Maybe my words mean something to you, or you think that I add some sort of value to your brain. Thank you for that. If you don't like this advice, get rid of it. But uh, it seems to me that you don't have to tell anybody who you don't want to tell that you're no longer a part of the church. You don't owe anybody that explanation. 
um, the Mormon church makes you feel like you owe them an explanation because you're leaving the one true church. Well, don't you need to explain yourself? No, I don't need to explain myself. And so now you're probably wondering, well, who do I explain myself to? Explain yourself to the people who you, when you're laying on your bed at night, you think, "Ah, I should really tell that person. I don't feel like I'm being honest. So I'll tell that person. Only tell those people and let everybody else just find out. It's fine. It's fine if everybody else finds out that way. Uh, That voice, the one that tells you what you should be doing at at 4 a.m. or whatever time it is when you're just laying in bed and you're like, "Ah, I don't feel like I'm meeting my full potential in these aspects. Listen to that voice. And if that voice tells you, hey, go out and, and tell these people, then do it. Otherwise, fuck them. Next clip. In addition to the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith purported to translate another book called the Book of Abraham, which uh, was in a different language, some ancient Egyptian language. And he published his full translation of the Book of Abraham, which was he said was all about Abraham's journey to Egypt and lots of detail about Egypt and Abraham in Egypt and things. Um, the original manuscripts was were destroyed in a fire in Chicago, and so he was safe from anybody um, exposing his translation. Until it was discovered that actually some of these manuscripts had, dev- had survived and they had not been destroyed. And modern scholars who actually knew the language, uh, including some Mormon scholars, translated it again, a true translation, which had nothing whatever to do with Abraham or Egypt. This is an absolute cast-iron demonstration that Joseph Smith was a complete fake and charlatan. And this is fully documented. Okay, uh, next part of the video. The Dawkins is now talking about the Book of Abraham and saying that it is a fabrication. He, you, you saw that. Um, so, fact check, true fact check true isn't that fun uh the book of abraham is not a actual translation is not a literal translation even though joseph smith claimed that it was um now there are a few more things about this that you might find interesting uh not only is the book of abraham not a factual literal translation as joseph smith claimed that it was um but we this is actually not new information Since 1912, the world has known that this is true. The world has known this since 1912. I'm I'm putting an article up on the screen right now, and I'm going to add a fuck. Uh, I'm putting an article on the screen right now. Uh, Really can't explain it any better than this. It says, again, 1912, New York Times. 1912, New York Times. Museum walls proclaim fraud of Mormon prophet. Here's the subtitle. Sacred books claim to have been given divinely to the first prophet are shown to be taken from old Egyptian originals, their translation being a work of imagination. What a comparison with Metropolitan Museum treasure shows. So we the, this isn't new. I found this out in like 2019, roughly. Uh... <laughs> I found this out a hundred years after the rest of the world did. Yeah. Um, But a couple of other things that you might be interested in. Uh, Not only was the Book of Mormon a false translation, and not only was the Book of Abraham a false translation, but there was a third one. It's called the Kinderhook Plates. On page 490 of Rough Stone Rolling... Richard Bushman said this about the Kinderhook plates. Church historians continued to insist on the authenticity of the Kinderhook plates until 1980, when an an examination conducted by the Chicago Historical Society, processor of one plate, proved it was a 19th century creation. So if you don't know the the story of the Kinderhook plates, I'll fill you in. By the way, go buy a copy of the CS letter by Jeremy Reynolds. Uh, the Kinderhook plates. Um, there were some guys 
who didn't think that Joseph Smith was a prophet and they wanted to prove it to him. So as a joke, essentially, they made a bunch of plates using acid etching and the acid etching is how they put the symbols into it and they buried them in a hill and then they said, hey, Joe, let's go dig. And then they went and then they found them. And then they said, wow, this is incredible. You should translate these. And he said, oh, oh, God, I would love to translate these. And then he said this. I insert facsimiles of six brass plates found near Kinderhook. I have translated a portion of them. Hmm, did you, Joe? And they, and they contain the history of a person with whom they were found. He was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and that he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. So yeah, that's a that's a fun little story. Uh, if you want to go down a Kinderhook Plates rabbit hole, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of them on YouTube. Uh, this isn't the video for that. This is a Joe Rogan and Richard Dawkins video, but uh, I just thought that that was a fun thing to throw in. Well, since we're talking about um, false translations anyway, so next clip. They think they think that um, you've got to have a belief in some mm. kind of higher power in order to be moral. But the weird thing is that it doesn't have to be the same higher power as the one you believe in. Anyone will do right. as, long as, as long as there is one. But if you don't believe in a higher power, you must be uh, immoral. Uh, you, you, and, and that is totally ridiculous when you think about the horrible immorality of, for example, the, both the Bible and the Quran, which are, which are horrific in the sense that if you, believe, if you actually got your morals, if you got your moral values from the Old Testament or the Quran, and they share them a great deal, of course, you would be stoning adulterers to death and stoning people to death for breaking the Sabbath and doing sacrifices, human sacrifices and animal sacrifices, all sorts of horrible things which, of course, do go on now uh, in Islamic countries especially, gay people getting thrown off high buildings and women being beheaded for the crime of being seen with a man, not their husband, and that kind of thing. Um, so that, that we, we can see what you get when you get your morality from an Abrahamic scripture. And yet there are still people in this country who say you cannot be moral unless you believe in a higher power. Unpopular opinion time. I, about, I am about to defend the Bible <laughs> to Richard Dawkins. I don't like what he's doing here. I don't think the Bible is true. I basically have the same opinion of it that Richard Dawkins does, but uh, maybe my personality is different. Maybe my, uh, my experience with it is different. Like, who knows why... The two of us would disagree so profoundly about this point, but what he's doing right here, he's saying society is so much better. We don't need God. We don't need morals because look, we have great morals now. Our morals are better than all of humanity's thousands of years ago. That That's his argument right here. And that doesn't seem like a fair criticism to me. It seems like the fair criticism would be to go back to the, the same time that those beliefs were held by the people who wrote the Bible and see what the non-theists of that time believed. My guess is they believe the same goddamn thing that the theists believe in. What he's doing is, is he's just saying, yeah, aren't they so stupid because they made the mistake of writing down what they used to think. That would be no different, in my opinion, than looking back at your own schoolwork when you were in second grade or maybe your journal or maybe like writing that you used to have to do and say, this person is fucking stupid. They're a dumb person because look at the work that they're putting out. I mean, Jesus Christ, what is this shit, right? Like that's that's what he's doing here. It's not a fair comparison. I, I think that he's building up a straw man and he's tearing it down easily, but that's not impressive to me. For, for one moment, he talks about things that are still going on in the Middle East today, but most of it is, he's he's talking about old things. Nobody, nobody legitimately believes that if you walk around... Uh, the Bible Belt, and you're a woman who's seen with another man who's not your husband, that you're going to get stoned to death. Nobody really believes that these criticisms hold up today. And so, while I agree with the overall premise that you don't need morality 
to believe in God. I think it's this type of debate or discussion or whatever you want to call it that um, angers Christians and angers theists and makes them think that all atheists hate them and think that they're stupid. I don't think that they're stupid. I think they're just as smart as me. I think we have different needs. I think we have different existential needs. I think that we have different ways of coping with fear of the afterlife and different ways of finding meaning in, in on planet Earth right now. I don't think that that I'm I'm probably very average intelligence. So yeah, next clip. What do you think let's extract this this concept of a higher power? Let's let's get rid of it. Let's let's get rid of it. where where do you think people get their morals and their ethics from? Now that's a profoundly difficult question. Uh, we clearly don't get them from religion, uh, and yet we get them from somewhere, and you can demonstrate that by the fact that uh, the moral values of any particular century are markedly different from those of other centuries, uh, even decades. So in the 21st century, we here now have moral values which are really significantly different from 100 years ago or 200 years ago, or 300 years ago. And um, within any one of those centuries, you could take people who are in the vanguard of moral progress. For example, in the 19th century, Abraham Lincoln, Charles Darwin, T.H. Huxley would have been on the liberal uh, progressive end of the spectrum, and other people would have been on the opposite end. But even Abraham Lincoln, for example, made a speech that I quoted in Outgrowing God in which he said, of course, no, nobody would seriously think that black people are the equal of white people. Nobody would seriously say that black people should be allowed to vote or should be uh, um, allowed to marry white people. Um, this is Abraham Lincoln who freed the slaves right. and was, as I say, in the forefront of progressive thought. Charles Darwin again was in favor of freeing the slaves. He was passionately anti-slavery. But he too... Uh, thought that there was no question about black people being the equal of white people. They obviously weren't. And, 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 and Huxley, Thomas Huxley, again, Darwin's bulldog, thought the same way. Now, those people were at the, at the forefront, as I say. Today, they would still be in the forefront, and they would be horrified to look back on what they said mm. in the 19th century. Well, something is changing as the centuries go by. I, in Outgrowing God, I call it something in the air, which, of course, doesn't explain anything. But what I mean by that is that it's, it's not literally hovering in the air, but it's a, con co it's a con collection of, oh, um, conversations between people, dinner party conversations, um, parliamentary decisions, congressional debates, uh, judicial decisions by judges, juries, um, newspaper articles, journalism, all these things together conspire together to produce something in the air, something that, that, that defines a, a given century or maybe even a given decade uh, with the moral values of that, of that decade. All right, this is where I, I'm, I'm going to try and steal man what I think he's saying here, and then I'm going to try and... <sighs> give my criticism, I guess. I, th I think that what he's trying to say is culturally, and by culturally, I mean like the thing that is in the air, as he says, culture uh, starts to, you know, we're all, we're all playing this game with one another as neighbors, as coworkers, as family members, as people that you interact with on the street. I've sometimes tried to imagine it as like, uh, there's a there's a imagine a pyramid okay and there's you at the top and then there's the people who you interact with the most and this would be your family this would be your very close friends these would probably be like your neighbors who you see the most often and then um, th there's the one step down the people that you see quite often but um, not as intimately so coworkers. Um, maybe more extended family, depending on what your situation is there. And then you have the people who you really don't interact with at all, but you kind of like bounce off of them all day. So this would be like cashiers. This would be like maybe people on social media who you're just kind of like sending a like or you're messaging or whatever. And then there's the people who you're interacting with 
ex- in, an, in a very indirect way. And this would be like somebody who you pass in the car on the street, you know, somebody who cuts you off in traffic. The, there's this there's this pyramid of the people you interact with the most down to the people that you barely interact with. And then at the very bottom of the scale, I guess you could say, there are people on the other side of the planet who you will never meet. I like to imagine, although maybe it's just a very optimistic view that I have, I think that people will reciprocate the type of behavior that you that you treat them with. If you're nice to somebody at the grocery store, if you smile at them, if you're good to your coworkers, if you communicate well with them, most people will respond in kind to you. And so I think that what he's saying is that there's this thing in the air. He keeps saying in the air and it bothers me, but and I'll get to why after. But he he keeps saying like there's this thing going on where it's like, okay, we're all kind of getting better at realizing how that when we treat others well, we also get treated well. It becomes like, it almost becomes selfish if you think about it. I want people to be nice to me, so I'm nice to other people. And morality could be built that way. So there's this other thing that he says where he says there's something changing. And I mean, to me, it's obvious what's changing. We are learning more about human beings and what makes us tick and what breaks us, for lack of a better word. I mean, the Vessel van der Kolk, is that his name? The guy who wrote The Body Keeps the Score? He he only released that book in 2014. And he's the guy who discovered that PTSD was a thing, okay? He discovered that while studying, I think it was soldiers that were coming back from Vietnam in the, the 70s, 80s, in Boston. He discovered that, P, he discovered PTSD in the 70s. Okay, before then, we didn't know that this was ruining people's minds, that it was is sending them to hell, essentially. And so something is changing. I mean, there's an old, there's an old phrase that goes, when people know better, they do better. Well, we're just learning more. Every year, we're learning more about what makes us tick, what makes us happy, what makes us successful, what makes us feel like there's meaning in our life. There's, there's this thing that I always jump back to, which is the idea between an ought and an is. If you've watched my videos, you've seen me talk about this. The more we learn about human beings in the real world, the less of a jump we're making from is to ought. And that's better for us. Now, do we need a God for that? No, we don't. But I guess now I'm getting into my criticisms here. And it's really just one, well, I have a couple of criticisms. I'm not going to number them because whenever, <laughs> whenever I number a criticism, I say that I have three and then all of a sudden I have 25. So I'm just going to say I have criticisms. Um, the first thing that I don't like, this is general. This isn't a, this isn't a Richard Dawkins thing. Um, this perfectly illustrates to me how much easier it is to tear something down than it is to build something back up. Uh, this this is probably like the 45th minute of this uh, podcast episode. And up till this point, they've just had a jolly good laugh. Um, you know, religion is silly, Mormonism, Scientology. Blah, 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 blah. And now the first difficult question, well, if there's no God, where does morality come from? And his first answer is, well, in my book, I said, I'm not going to try and do his accent because I'm terrible at it. In my book, I said that it's in the air. I mean, by that definition, God creates morality because God is in the air or something. Like, it's so vague. It's so vague. And it makes us, again, it makes people, it makes atheists or whatever you want to call people who think like me and Dawkins, it makes us look like um, we want to just tear things down and we never want to offer a solution. We never want to build anything back up. We never want to really say like, this could be an answer. Let's try this. And so that that just kind of bothers me that as soon as he's pressed with an actual difficult question, he says, oh, I always say this is something that's in the air. It's like, yeah, that you've just given a more vague description than Christians who say that it was God. I don't know. That bothers me. So, yeah, ironically, as soon as I, I right after I say I have a whole bunch of criticisms, I really only pick out one that is bothering me enough to mention um, just, this just goes to show that I suck at making videos. Okay. Uh, the last thing that he talks about, 
he just kind of says like it's in the air which i hate again i hate that but then he he does a decent job of just describing the public debate he says things are getting better because we're all publicly debating and i think this goes back to what i said earlier you know we're learning more we're learning what makes us tick we're learning how you break a human being and we're saying "Mm, maybe we should try to avoid what breaks human beings what types of things should we be avoiding and that's a that's an open question you know and maybe morality is dictated by those types of things we know that human beings are collaborative and social beings right we know that what makes us feel good what makes us what motivates us is doing something that that works well for our family for taking care of the people that we care about and so you know maybe there is something to that random pyramid idea that i described earlier maybe maybe we should be focusing the most attention on the people at the top of that scale but remembering that we are you know the fourth rung down for that car that that we're angry at in the middle of the road and maybe we could stop being angry at them maybe we could just take a little bit of that uh yuckiness right out of right out of the pyramid um that's that's really all that i have for today um let me know if this made you think of anything if there are any videos like this that you'd like me to cover go ahead and shoot them to me at the uber mormon at gmail.com and that'll do it for us today thank you for watching like and subscribe, share this with a friend. Have a good day, everybody.